and on PBS Learning Media that's available for people who are inspired or whose interest is piqued on a topic by virtue of watching one of our films. We want them to have avenues to learn more. That's why we made the film. And we know that with PBS, that's going to happen. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. All right, we ready? One, two, one, two. Showtime. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I'm really Korean. You know, I'm pretty Mexican. You descend from a Native American woman. Whoa. Plot twist. Oh my gosh. This is him? I love knowing I'm a part of this. This experience, I'm going to carry with me the rest of my life. Finding Your Roots premieres January 4th or stream at nepm.org. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. A world-renowned glass artist looks back on his five-decade career. I feel so fortunate that the pieces that I like to make and the concepts that I like to explore in glass seem to be things that people like to collect. We'll discuss the New Music Alliance's mission to showcase local musicians. I thought that with the songbook, what we can do is show what's the best stuff that people have been able to do and show that it's as good as anything that they could hear on the radio. And we'll take a stroll down Pittsfield's North Street for their final arts walk of the season. A low-key environment with the artist and if you find something you love you can take it home but if not you got to have a little bit of fun with your neighbors and your fellow artists in the community. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saivalis Bauer. Artist Josh Simpson first made glass in 1971 while spending a winter semester at Goddard College. That year, he rented land in northern Vermont, lived in a teepee, and built a tiny glass working studio out of old barn beans. Today, the 72-year-old Shelburne Falls resident is considered by many to be one of the best glass blowers in the world. Producer Dave Frazier talked with Simpson recently, who reflected back on his 50-year career. When I started to blow glass, I never for a moment considered it as a potential career. It was just the most fun, exciting thing that I could possibly do at the time. For half a century, Josh Simpson has been creating art objects from glass. His studio is this big red barn just off the Mohawk Trail in Shelburne Falls. I think that all the work that I do is in some way related to space, whether planets that I make give you an idea of what it's like to be an astronaut orbiting around a small little world. But I also make, I, I make pieces that I call tektites that have uh, used the same formula of glass as meteorites that have fallen to Earth from outer space. I also make plates that are what I feel are my idea of what it's like to look up at the sky on a perfect summer night. The process starts with a small, red-hot, malleable mass of liquid on the end of a blowpipe. Fighting gravity with every turn, Simpson stops only to reheat and then rework the piece until he's satisfied with the outcome. Glass is insanely hot. It, you can never touch it. It is one material that, as an artist, I can never, ever touch it with my hands. The result would be horrific. And so my job is to create something and get that liquid to cooperate. That's part of the challenge, that's part of what makes it fun, is the fact that you need to get as close as you possibly can to this dangerous liquid. That's good. Ideally without burning yourself, but or close enough to feel the heat. In 1976, Simpson started making glass planets, complete with oceans, continents, volcanoes, and clouds. Some of them have literally left this Earth into outer space, traveling with his wife, astronaut Catherine Katie Coleman, 
who lived on the International Space Station for several months in 2011. The way he looks at this, at the piece, the way he just is so sure that if he wants it to be a certain way, he can just do that. It's in a way, it's like the space program, where people say, well, when are we going to get to Mars? Well, we're going to go when we're ready. And it's, and it's a long journey, and it's a lot of actually small steps. I see that in his work as well, where something that he's been thinking about, you know, 40 years ago, you know, a kind of combination of glass, and then with what he's then been learning, I'll see him kind of go back to that and go, wow, that thing that I couldn't do back then, now I've got a way to do that. Josh and Katie married in 1997, and one would think that marrying an astronaut was the reason for the creation of the planets. But according to Josh, that's not the case. I was making planets long before I met my wife, it is amazing to me that Katie joined NASA in 1992 and she has gotten to explore the world the way I imagine exploring the world. I make these glass spheres and I, I think about flying around those, whether it's an underwater scene or whether I feel like I'm an astronaut flying in orbit around one. Many of the planets Simpsons made have been planted on mountaintops hidden in forests and buried at sea all over the world as part of his infinity project. He estimates that at least 3,000 globes have been hidden in diverse places around the world. When I moved here 40 years ago, no one was collecting my glass. And I thought, you know, I should, I should make little spheres and hide them around the world, not with my name on them, but I should just hide them and maybe someday they'll be found by a random stranger or by a kid, and it's kind of a present to give to somebody in the future. Since learning glass blowing in the early 1970s, Simpson has made thousands of planets, as well as tremendous glass platters, goblets, and bowls. The largest planets are a foot in diameter and weigh 50 pounds or more. I feel so fortunate that the pieces that I like to make and the work and the concepts that I like to explore in glass seem to be things that people like to collect. And I've just been incredibly lucky that people understand what I'm doing and want to share that. Western New England is home to several vibrant music scenes, and one local nonprofit's mission is to support and help advance the careers of the area's talented musicians. The New Music Alliance is dedicated to showcasing creative local musicians who write original music, as well as promoting our region as a destination for original music writing, production, and performances. I spoke with Executive Director Mark Sherry, Assistant Director Mark Ramon, and Board Member Miriam Sirota to learn more about the organization, its events, and initiatives. The local music scene is just so incredibly rich in this region, and um, it's not necessarily well known anywhere out of the area, and musicians traditionally get attention uh, much more so if they're somewhere around, you know, either a major city or a music hub like, you know, Nashville or Austin or something like that. And and around here, it's much more difficult for really good artists to get the you know, kind of attention um, that they deserve. Um, there's an amazing amount of music here. And a lot of people do go to New York City eventually. But a lot of people stay and a lot of people come back here. And I just felt like we needed to do something to give them the kind of attention and also uh, foster young musicians and try and help them assist their careers and help them advance their careers. You recently launched the Essential Western New England Songbook that contains 151 songs written by artists from this region. Talk to me about why this was an important project and what makes this songbook so essential. I thought that with the songbook, what we can do is show what's the best stuff that people have been able to do and show that it's as good as anything that they could hear on the radio. In fact, it's a lot of it you do hear on the radio. When you look at that and you see the breadth 
and the quality that's there. And you say, you know, I can go out and listen to some of these people on the weekend. I'm sure there are names that will surprise people that are included from this area that they listen to all the time. So what can people expect from these from this songbook? Well, it goes all the way back to the, to the 1950s. There are people on it like the Five Satins and Gene Pitney, who are just icons from back then and produced some great stuff. Bill Flagg. Bill Flagg as well. He's the inventor of rockabilly. Yeah. Uh, and but then you go, you know, to people who are around us right now, Taj Mahal from Springfield, Arlo Guthrie from out in the Berkshires, a band like um, Stained from Springfield, which was, you know, a mega selling band, um, Avery Sharp, a, a legend in the jazz world. We could go on. <laughs> but they're also, what I really enjoy about it, too, is that there are a lot of young bands coming out of here. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to give an example, if I can, um, who to thunk it, uh, who are great. They're a women's band. They're very young. They're very original. There's like nothing derivative about what they do. Um, yes, it's funk music, but, but they, they are in the, the songbook. Now, there are several ways that you work with local artists, including offering workshops that are available on your website, as well as having the New Music Alliance Radio Hour that the three of you are DJs for, and it airs on several local stations. Um, now, two years into this show, what have you enjoyed most about it, and has there been anything that has surprised you about doing this radio show? I just think that it's great that there are alternatives to what large companies and nationwide commercial stations are feeding us for entertainment. We can listen to local talent on small commercial radio stations, see bands at local venues, and listen to songs that were produced by local recording studios. I, I think it's an alternative that people will find very you know, pleasing and, and something different if they just go out and make an effort to uh, try something different. It, it's a lot of fun. Um, the way it's done is that every week somebody puts together the playlist and then you have one of the other DJs as a guest and usually Violet who does, who's fantastic and does our editing. And so putting together the list itself is, is so much fun. I tend to, you know, go for themes. Everybody has their, their own thing. We all, and it's, it's wonderful to see people's um, taste, their point of view, what they, you know, what what draws them to certain artists. Like I know, if, you know, we work with this person, they might bring in some, you know, classical or jazz music that we've never heard before. You know, when I first started this, one of the things that amazed me is that I thought eventually we were going to run out of really good songs <laughs> from artists from this area. And you know, popping up. Because I'm very, very committed to only, you know, sh showing like really what the best of, of music can be so people can say, wow, you know, I want to I want to support this. So um, we haven't even come close to running out of all the stuff that people are producing and have produced. Well, um, from this area that is really great stuff. Well, I wanted to talk to touch on also because Miriam and Mark Sherry, you're both originally from New York, but have relocated to this region. Mark, you have always lived in, in the Western New England region. What has been your favorite thing about music and artists that come out of this region specifically? With a, there's a lot of uh, colleges in Western New England, and that's usually a great hub for listening to new young local talent and one thing i want to just um reiterate is that just remember everything that we play is original music by local artists so, you know so it's all original music by local artists now for any local artists out there how do you encourage them to be a part of the new music alliance new music alliance at gmail uh, dot com and you'll be able to get a hold of us or just go to our website. I think all that information is there too. Since May of 2012, the Downtown Pittsfield Cultural Association has hosted what is known as the First Friday's Arts Walk. 
On the first Friday of the month, between the hours of 5 and 8 p.m., members of the community can tour several businesses and galleries along North Street in Pittsfield, where the works of local artists are on display, oftentimes with the artists on hand to meet the public. Friday, December 3rd, was the last installment of the Arts Walk of the Year, and Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan hit North Street to bring us this next story. What better way to usher in the holiday season than with festive lights and the sweet sounds of seasonal standards being sung by carolers? But while one season was being welcomed in, another was drawing to a close, as December 3rd marked the last of the first Friday's Arts Walks of 2021. The event is put on by the Downtown Pittsfield Cultural Association, and since its inception in May of 2012, it served to connect community, businesses, galleries, and artists. Artists like Eileen Richard. A friend of mine who is a nurse over at Berkshire Medical, she, um, she started it because she felt there was a need and she was very much into the arts, and she would literally take people for a walk through the downtown and have there were different art shows that were placed in different buildings and different spaces in the area and um, it was basically a whole evening's worth of art you know art adventures and it was a fun thing they would meet up she would meet up with people over at the bus station and walk them through downtown that's how I got to meet her and that's also how I got to understand what the art walk is Richard is just one of over 20 artists located here at 311 North Street in Pittsfield the space, known as the New Art Studios and Gallery, has an almost clubhouse-like feel to it. The most recent addition to the club can be found here in the corner studio. I'm a fairly new artist to the New Arts Gallery and Studios community, and I've started joining in on the first Friday's Arts Walk back in September. Uh, the artists here, though, are a pretty close-knit group of artists, and they've been doing this since the very beginning of First Friday's Arts Walk. So it's a long-starting tradition for a lot of the artists here, and uh, I'm just happy to be joining in. Because there are so many artists under one roof here, the new arts building is essentially the central hub of the Arts Walk. For Eileen Richard, who's been around for several of these events, she knows what to expect, but for Porus, the experience of opening her workspace to members of the community is still new, and she hopes that it's something that both sides can enjoy. For folks coming into the studios, it's a really good opportunity to be in a low-key environment with the artists and looking at the art, and if you find something you love, you can take it home, but if not, you got to have a little bit of fun with your neighbors and your fellow artists in the community. While there's sure to be plenty of foot traffic here at the new art studios, this isn't the only game in town tonight. There are several other locations up and down North Street that people can visit as well. And having the map uploaded to my phone makes them easy to find. Soma's Aroma is delivered on the good times with succulent scents, tasty suds, and artist Elizabeth Nelson on hand preparing her next work of art. TKG Realty had several works on display as well including these two pieces by Kenny Frelinghuysen. Working our way back to the new art studio, we come across the Hotel on North, where Scott Taylor's work was being exhibited. We stopped by Taylor's studio in Dalton earlier in the day, where we discussed what to expect that night. The show that you'll see at, at Hotel on North uh, really came out of, of being in COVID. Um, and, and it's called When Worlds Collide. So the interesting part of it is, is that the theme is all over the place, but so were my emotions. And as an artist, I paint emotions. Um, I'm also a landscape, a landscape painter as well. But, but I, really, I really enjoy putting myself out there. It's something that all of the artists are doing during the art walk, putting themselves out there, with the best case scenario being that they can sell some of their work. But while it's good to hope for the best, sometimes the safe bet is to temper expectations and just hope to have a nice time with the community. We get a mixed bag of people that come in here. We get people that are seriously looking to buy art. There's people that are just here to entertain themselves for a few hours, get out. You know, it's cold, so they want to get out for a few hours. And it's a mixed bag. It really is. 
Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. And in this week's Digital Extra, we hear from the three artists participating in Pittsfield's final First Friday's Arts Walk of the season to learn about their individual styles and experience as artists. I am an abstract artist. Um, I do a variety of types of abstracts because I translate music into paintings. So that means that sometimes a piece of music will be very geometric and straight lines and sometimes the music is very soft and moody and so I have much more of an abstract landscape kind of feel. Don't miss this digital extra available online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. Award-winning journalist Richie Davis is back with a new book entitled Goodwill and Ice Cream. This collection picks up where his last book, Inner Landscapes, leaves off, sharing more true tales from extraordinary lives from throughout our region. The stories span four decades and were originally published in The Recorder, the daily newspaper in Franklin County, where Davis worked as a reporter for nearly 45 years. Davis spoke with me about the book and the importance of local journalism. One of the stories was about a, um, unlike any, any of the other stories, it was basically a tour of all of the Franklin County ice cream places. Ten ice cream places on the first day and seven on the second. The we is a, a friend of mine, uh, 13 years old, who I took along because I figured, how can I describe, like, the differences between ice cream? And so uh, Ethan Schweitzer Gaslin uh, came along with me and I, because I knew he could, he could articulate things in a way I could never do it. And... Um, we, we finished up uh, the second day and we went to the Ashfield Hardware Store, um, where Laura Bissett, who co-owns the store, um, said, um, we, we want the spirit of goodwill and ice cream to prevail. Because they were selling ice cream for a dollar a cone or 50 cents for kids. And um, goodwill and ice cream just kind of spoke to the, the spirit of the whole book for me. Now, Goodwill and Ice Cream serves up true stories originally published in the Greenfield Recorder spanning over four decades. How did you go about choosing which stories to include in these collections, and how did it feel to revisit the stories? Well, you know, there are stories that are there to entertain. We tell stories to inform. Um, but what was really important for me is stories that really nurture the soul and the stories that are local, but stories that really are universal and uh, re where you can read between the lines and come away with uh, a lot more than the, the, the black and white that's in front of you. And so uh, the first book was, was really focused on personalities, profiles of people I really thought were, um, should be included because I didn't want them to be forgotten. And the second book, there were a lot of different kinds of stories, uh, some of them not all local people, um, but there were stories that, that I felt were universal and they had something to say to people. This is a story about Auschwitz. This is a story about Robert J. Lertzema, who is a, a, a public, public um, radio announcer. And there's a story about a documentary about farming families that I thought really spoke to the, the area. You're speaking about this wide range of stories that are included in these collections and the personalities that are in them as well. You have a recovering substance abuser who becomes chauffeur, a bodyguard, and sometimes wrestling buddy for the Dalai Lama to a self-taught fiddler who weaves community with his bow and heart. Which story or themes in this collection really speak to you the most? Well, you know, I dedicated the book um at the very, very end to David Kaner, uh, who was that fiddler who died about a month ago and who is really central to um, not just uh, the community I live in, but to fiddlers around the world. And he's, but, but he's very inclusive in, in inviting people to, to just play and to come in and, and join in. And I think that's the, the spirit of, of goodwill. 
In the book, you also touch on the changes and struggles of the newspaper and print industry um, that you have witnessed in your nearly 45 years as a reporter and editor. What is the value and importance of community journalism? I think um, newspapers uh, and you know local media can really help bring people together and really inform people about not only who's in the community and what they're doing, but give people a taste of the richness of the diversity in within the community and also ideas that people adopt and bring in and ways to share. And I, I just think it's really important. One part in the book that really stood out to me was when you said, quote, for years I was seemingly left behind as I watched fellow reporters leave for the big time or give up newspapering for what others considered a real job. Why did you choose to stay in this area? What is it about living in this region, specifically Franklin County, that is so special to you? I, I just feel like we are so lucky to live in a place that's just rich in just having the space to suggest for that people should be in, inviting each other in to, to participate and in, in fiddling and in, in playing and dancing. If you can't dance, do it anyway. If, a lot of the pretense of um, you know more areas that are that are more built up and more um, rigid um, is is really. It's somewhat absent here, and I th and I think that uh, there's a lot of latitude for people to be themselves, and that that just appeals to me tremendously. That does it for Connecting Point for this evening. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And a heads up for our regular viewers on NEPM TV, beginning on January 6th, Connecting Point will be moving to a new day and time, Thursdays and Saturdays at 7.30 p.m. We'll be here Fridays at 6 for just two more weeks, and then you can catch us at our new day and time for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Janae and Bella, activists in the fight for black liberation. See the movement reframing the discourse on race and justice.